in the work of our Lord, generally speaking. And I entertain the hope that I may be able tonight to speak to you in such fashion that you not only will derive pleasure from your coming, but also that you'll be benefited and will profit thereby. Our sole purpose in this, as in every such effort, is simply to preach the truth, not without addition, without subtraction, without modification. Some of you are aware of the fact that though I have engaged continuously in full-time meeting work for 50 years or more, that I'm no longer doing that type of work. At the end of last year, I terminated my full-time meeting work. I had anticipated that the time had come, I have already reached and passed my 84th birthday, that I ought to quit traveling from coast to coast and from the Great Lakes to the Gulf. So a number of years ago, I quit accepting invitations for meetings, generally speaking, and so these meetings ran out at the end of last year. And so this is indeed a rare exception to the rule. I have been here so many times, I had enjoyed the meetings that I had conducted here so much, and the brethren had been insistent in my coming back this year. And I made the exception, and that's why I'm here tonight. I recognize that I have many things in common with all of you. That is commitment to the truth, our realization of our dependence upon God, and our obligation to teach and preach His Word faithfully. I do not think that there's been a time, certainly not in my lifetime, when there was so great need for the proclamation of the primitive the pure gospel as now. When our nation is itself in the very throes of rebellion against the basic principles of morality. When a time has come that those of the highest circles are themselves treating with contempt the basic principles of biblical teaching and would lead us into a pagan, corrupt, and depraved society that was characteristic only of ancient times. If ever there was a time when the word needs to be preached plainly and emphatically, it's now. A country that today not only treats the Bible with contempt in large measure, but supports and encourages practices that are themselves in basic conflict with biblical teaching. In our country today, over a million and a half babies are aborted. Tiny infants who have no one to defend themselves, who are themselves destroyed by people because of their selfishness and of their depravity. When practices such as homosexuality, characteristic of many today are winked out, if not winked out, at least acceptable in many areas. And when the Bible has become the most unpopular book in our country. I say this because it's the truth that people today look with greater disdain on the Word of God than any other book in existence. There are a number of reasons for that. One is men may ignore and disregard other books that are to them unpopular with a little consequence. But the Bible exercises an influence that those who oppose its teaching fear. They recognize that they may pursue their course of ungodliness only when they have destroyed its influence. And so there is today a concerted effort on the part of many to destroy the influence of the Bible in our land. At a time when it is legal and acceptable, not only from the standpoint of civil authorities, but the tens of thousands of families from the schools to distribute contraceptive devices to children and yet deny those same children to have the privilege of reading from the Bible in these schools. When a country has descended to that level, it makes us wonder what the future holds and if we're not rapidly approaching that day that characterized Sodom in her destruction. Since many of the practices today in our land are those that characterize that ancient day. 
And so I thought it not out of order tonight for us to focus our attention upon that sacred volume because it's under attack not only from those who have no religion, but even from those who profess some. For example, in our own ranks and from some of our own virtues are today being heard sentiments that are themselves destructive of the basic principles of New Testament Christianity. And one of the greatest regrets that I have in having reached the age when I'm no longer able to unsheath the sword of the Spirit and fight the battles for righteousness that I once did on many polemic platforms is that the liberal preachers, it's also in the so-called liberal arts colleges, professors who are themselves teaching basic principles that are themselves evil in nature and which will corrupt and destroy ultimately those who accept them. So the time is here when those who love God's word and who respect its teaching want to hear it defended and emphasized. The Bible abounds, of course, with statements to that end. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 17, I think, every scripture is inspired of God and is also profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, completely furnished under every good work. Paul said to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 16, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and the doctrine, and in the same conduct, verses uh, 8, verses 17, 19, he added, continue in these things. For in so doing, thou shalt say, both thyself and them that hear thee. This evidence is the fact that not only is our own salvation dependent upon our commitment to the truth, but that of others whom we may be able to influence by our teaching. And so tonight, let's raise some questions regarding this book. It's here, and it must be accounted for. At some time and place, it began. By whom? Well, I'd like to talk a little bit tonight. By whom it was not produced. In the first place, it wasn't produced by atheists. The word atheist itself signifies there is no God. It's made up of what's known in Greek as the privative, the word a, which in Greek means not, and then from theos, the ordinary word for God in the New Testament, and putting the two together, it simply says literally, no God. And this is the view that characterizes many in our land today. A large percentage of people among us over the country are atheists. They simply deny the existence of a divine being. And yet, note this please. David said, the fool is set in his heart. Psalms 14.1. The fool is set in his heart. There's no God. Did you notice who he said said it? And secondly, where? In the first place, nobody but a fool would or could make such an observation. The evidence is too strengthening. The proofs are too numerous for thoughtful and intelligent people to reach such a conclusion. And secondly, did you notice where he said it? In his heart. Not out of his head, mind you, the result of <coughs> processes of reasoning based upon premises that lead to correct conclusions, but out of his heart, and a hard and perverse one at that. Why have long thought that most of the skepticism that they prevail issues from people who want to get rid of the idea of God on the ground, but if they can get rid of the idea of God, they get rid of the restraints that God puts around them. And this is the basis for much of the skepticism that is today prevailing. Why I'm as certain as I stand before you tonight that the atheists, the infidels, the agnostics, 
and believers have ever died and died did not pen that remarkable book. In the next place, I'm quite sure, very, very sure, that the Catholics didn't write it. There's much evidence to that end that there are statements in the book that, the, that they would never have penned why they teach that the Pope, the alleged head of the church, was the is the a descendant of Peter, and that Peter was himself an unmarried man, and that therefore his successors must remain such. Why this is obviously false with reference to Peter, bear in mind that the book very clearly teaches that Peter had a mother-in-law. Well, obviously, if one has a mother-in-law, he must indeed have a wife. And so the Bible clearly teaches that Peter was a married man. And so no Catholic would ever pin the same that is in such obvious conflict with the doctrines of the ecclesiasticism to which he subscribes. And there are many other instances. Do you suppose that the people who subscribe to those doctrines would have penned such statements as Paul's in the last hours, or at least the last days of his life upon earth, that only Luke was with him? Bear in mind that those words were written while in Rome in a prison. Where was the head of the church? If he were, as they allege, then the Pope of the Catholic Church. What of this? Men who subscribe to such an offering would not have penned such words as these to which I have alluded. And I'm equally sure, and I say it with kindness, I don't think the Methodists wrote it, because in their discipline, Article 9, they have this statement, wherefore the doctrine of faith, and faith only, is a most wholesome doctrine, and very full of comfort. Now, I want you to know carefully what that says. Wherefore, the doctrine of faith and faith only, not just faith, but faith only, is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. Contrast that, if you please, with a statement found in James chapter 2, verse 24. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Why do you suppose a person who believe that it's a very wholesome doctrine to teach that faith is alone or faith only results in salvation would have ever stated that it's not by faith only, that it's not that way. That's the only time that the expression faith only appears in the Bible. James 2 and 24. Make a mental or otherwise note of it. And remember, and look it up, and keep in mind the sharp contrast between the statement of the discipline that says it's a wholesome doctrine to teach salvation by faith only, and from which you derive much comfort. I must say to you that I would feel very little comfort myself in a doctrine that the Bible says is not true. Well, I conclude that those who so think that they did not write the Bible quite obviously would not have been such a statement. And I'm further certain that the Baptists didn't write it because, for example, in, well, in this instance, Galatians 5 and 4, the apostle said that whosoever would be justified to the law Ye are fallen away from grace. Would a doctrine subscribed to by people that says that you cannot fall from grace, would a statement of this nature find its way into their documents, or would it become a part of their manuscripts? Could anyone who subscribes to the doctrine of the impossibility of apostasy teach such a doctrine? I have in my possession a tract written by a man by the name of Sam Morris. Perhaps some of you are old enough to remember. And Sam Morris had a regular broadcast on a Mexican station. 
that blanketed the United States. This tract, written by Mr. Morris, who was one time the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Stamford, Texas, is entitled, Do a Christian Sins Damn His Soul? The first statement of the tract reads, we take the position, and I'm quoting now, we take the position that a Christian's sins do not damn his soul. It continues, all the good deeds a man may perform, all the debts he may pay, all the churches he may attend, will not make his soul any safer. And all the crimes that he may commit from murder to idolatry will not put him in any more danger. And then the statement, the way a man lives has nothing to do with the salvation of his soul. That's the doctrine of the impossibility of apostasy. Do you think that the hundreds of statements, 2,500 of them in the Bible, teaching the possibility of apostasy would have been penned by those who subscribe to such. There are 2,500 passages in the Bible warning of the possibility of apostasy. You can scarcely let your Bible fall open that it does not appear at some place where there is a warning with reference to sinful conduct threatening condemnation and eternal perdition. Why, obviously, those who subscribe to the doctrine of impossible apostasy did not write the Bible. I'm equally sure that our brethren didn't write it here today living. Do you think that 70% of them who will not attend all the services of the church would have ever written a statement like this? Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see that they approach you. Why, I think if they'd written it, they would have made it read like this. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together on Sunday morning, provided you have nowhere else to go. Why, I'm certain that our brethren living today never penned the New Testament because such statements as that would not appear. So, having seen who didn't write it, let's talk a little bit about who did and how. If I were to ask you tonight to take a pencil and notebook in hand and make a list of the various sources from which you think the book came, why, well, you might at first glance say, why, well, that would be a difficult task. It would require some effort. That would be a lengthy list of them, quite the contrary. When you had thought of every one of them, exhausted the possibility, that'd just be three. Only three possible sources from which it might have come. And these are, number one, it might have been written by good men or angels unaided, unaided by inspiration. Our second one, by bad men or devils. Our third way, by inspiration, by the dictates of the Holy Spirit through the pens of men directed thereby. Now let's examine these hypotheses. Number one, was it written by good men or angels, unaided? If so, we have good men and good angels perpetrating a fraud. Because if the Bible is not what it affects to be, it's a lie. It is a deceptive device in that event the design of which is to make, to lead people to, to believe that there is a future for them when there is not. The very fact that good, so-called good men would perpetrate a fraud destroys their character. Good men do not write lies or attempt to deceive people. 
we may therefore exclude the possibility of good men or angels having written the Bible unaided. We saw, secondly, that there was the hypothesis of bad men or devils. But now consider, it is a characteristic deeply ingrained in human nature to defend itself. There is the person in the penitentiary in this state, or any other for that matter, but that to him, at least, there were extenuating circumstances. People do not condemn their own actions. They justify them. If the Bible were written by bad men or devils, we have the unbelievable situation of lawyers writing out the most severe denunciation of lying ever been. If it were written by deceivers, we have men writing out their own condemnation. But liars and deceivers do not condemn themselves. The Bible was not written by bad men or devils. That lays with one hypothesis, and the correct one. It was written by inspiration. There's a passage of scripture that if you remember a little else about this connection tonight in my speech, I hope it'll make an indelible and ineffaceable impression. It's not known by our people nearly so well as it ought to be. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 8 through 13, in which Paul makes three points. Here are the points, and I shall then present the passage and give a brief exposition. Number one, it takes a divine revelation to know God. Number two, that revelation must be made in word. Number three, that revelation was made through the pens of men directed by the Holy Spirit. Now listen to the passage. What man knoweth will begin a little earlier in the, in the context and note the circumstances under which it was penned. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard. Neither is there in the heart of man the things the Father hath in store for them that love him. But the next verse says, He has revealed them to us by His Spirit. So this shows us that it takes a divine revelation in order to know God. Secondly, that revelation must be made in word. And Paul's illustration here is a simple one, but impressive. What man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man within him? Even so knoweth no man the things of God, save the spirit of God. Now that says the fact this. Just as you can't know what I'm thinking at the moment, until I tell you, using words, in like manner, we can't know what's been in God's mind until he tells us, using words. That tells us the nature of the case. The revelation must be made through the use of words. Now, finally, how is it made? Watch it. Which things also we speak. Which things also we, we speak. What things? The things of the mind of God. Which things we speak. We whom? All of the other inspired men. Which things we speak. Using words, mind you. Well, how? Note it. Not in words of man's wisdom. That eliminates the human element. But in the words of the Holy Spirit. That's verbal inspiration. And so we have here the affirmation. That, friends, is characteristic of the book that you call the Bible. It's your way to the other. It'll guide you safely through this stream of tears and ultimately into the home of the soul. Disregarded, an eternal perdition will be your destination. You now have a choice. You must make it. You cannot postpone that choice. Tomorrow may not come. If you are here tonight and don't know obey the gospel, I've shown you that there's a book in our midst that tells you the way to heaven. You ought by all means
Hebrews from 9 to 30. The engine of believing the gospel, Hebrews 11 6. Well, I pray the apostle to praise him. Mark 16 16, he that believeth not shall be damned. John 3 and 18, he that believeth not is condemned already. You must be ready. You must repent of your sins. Luke 13 3, except you repent, you'll perish. Acts 17 30, the times of this ignorance God went there. But now come down the door and they never heard of them. Second Peter 3 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but as long as ever goes, with not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You must repent. You must confess him, only stand nine and ten. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved, for the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. You must confess. You must be baptized into Christ. Romans 6, 3, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Then the next verse tells how it's done. We were buried with him. Buried with him. By God is him into that. Like as Christ was raised from the dead for the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life. Look when that new life started. When having come forth from the baptismal waters. Simply yes. But it's the dividing line between the lost and saved. On the one side, there are those of the road to heaven. On the other, the hell. Don't make the mistake, friends, of disregarding your responsibility. If you're here and obey him, but at once. Your condition is worse than it was before you ever obeyed the gospel. Better never said Peter to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto you. Second Peter 2, 20, 22. So why not tonight, in response to the invitation, make your calling and election. Shall we stand and sing?